Good morning. Again, it's good to have everybody with us online. Uh, this is a, uh, folks, this is just an, an unusual time. And uh, I know that people around the country and around the world are trying to make the most of it in doing what we can. And uh, we appreciate you being with us this morning. This morning, we are going to take a look at Luke chapter 19. So if you're not already there, we encourage you to turn over to Luke chapter 19. That's going to be our text for this morning. In 1965, Jackie DeShannon released a song that was written by Burt Bacharach and uh, Hal David that was called What the World Needs Now is Love. The spirit of the song is summed up in, in the chorus. I'm not going to sing it for you, by the way. The spirit of the song is, signed, uh, is summed up in the chorus that said, What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some but for everyone. The essence of the song is that there, was a, there were a lot of incredible things in the world at that time. In fact, in the song, they go on and they talk about such, such wonderful things as the nature around us, but there was one thing that seemed to be missing during that era, and it was love. And if you think back on the 1960s, especially the mid-1960s, you can understand what this was all about. You know, you look back, and for those of us who were there, you realize that civil rights leaders were being killed and political leaders were being assassinated, and there were riots in the communities and violence on the street. What the world needed was love. In a time of social advancement and technological development, the world needed something basic, something so basic as love. As I thought about that song this week, I also got to thinking about something that our modern world needs. You know, when you look around, it's incredible to see how technology has evolved. In fact, the, 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 uh, the sheltering in place or the, the no travel restrictions, those are made possible by the technology that we have today. We have incredible science. We have uh, uh, medicine that is working to keep us safe. But there's something missing in our world. And that something that is missing is peace. Now, that's, that can be a troubling realization, but there is hope. There is good news that peace is available. This morning, we're gonna take a look back at an opportunity uh, that Jesus had. And that opportunity presented him a chance to be known as a man of peace. We're going to go back to Luke chapter 19. It's a very familiar story. It is the story of Jesus' uh, triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But there's something that Luke inc includes in his gospel that kind of stands out from the others. All right, let's go to the text. Luke chapter 19, verses 29 through 38. Luke says, when he approached Bethpage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you there as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever set. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks why are you untying it, you shall say the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they spread their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. As Jesus' public ministry was beginning, actually right by now we're about three years into his public ministry, and it had really taken off. Um, he had been preaching, he had been teaching, he had been healing for, again, a little bit over three years now. And he was creating a buzz wherever he went. But something special was about to happen on this trip to Jerusalem. Jesus had his disciples go to a nearby village, and there they found, or he sent them on a mission to find a colt, to find some of the other writers talk about a donkey. Some of them talk about not only a donkey, but also a colt. But anyway, they, they find this colt that is tied up, 
And Jesus tells them, don't worry about it. Go fetch it. Bring it back to me. God's made the, made the plans. God's taking care of, of getting this for us. So that's exactly what they did. God had made the arrangement. All they needed to do was pick it up. It's kind of like ordering online today and uh, the pickup and uh, service that we have today. People are very familiar with that. Anyway, um, as they bring the colt back to Jesus, they put Jesus on the colt. The disciples put their coats on the colt. Um, and as Jesus got onto this, uh, this young animal, he began to make his way into Jerusalem. And when you think about this, it's a rather, a rather interesting story, a rather interesting concept. You see, Jesus wasn't riding into Jerusalem in some triumphant fashion on some white steed uh, that showed power. He was riding on a colt into the holy city to highlight his true nature. The rabbi that was coming into the city came in in humble means, but he wasn't going to go unnoticed. When Jesus hit town, word began to spread very quickly. People had gathered uh, into the city to, uh, to prepare for this great feast activity that was going to be going on over the next week. And as Jesus came into the city, the people began to flock around him. And as they gathered around him, uh, the, the community must have been a buzz, not only just in the uh, uh, what was going on uh, with, uh, with things that were going on during the feast activities, but now here Jesus is. Here he is, this one who had come into the, the community, who had come into this nation as a new rabbi, a different kind of rabbi. A different kind of teacher, one who was about to bring, who had brought uh, this this new sense of excitement and this new understanding into the Jewish religion. You can imagine what it was like as Jesus rode into town. As people are already predisposed to the excitement of the the religion of the day, Jesus comes riding in, and people were impressed. What they did was, according to Matthew chapter 21, most of the crowd spread their coat, coats in the road and others were cutting branches from trees and spreading them on the road. So as Jesus rode into town, the people were acknowledging him as someone special. In fact, when you go to look at, at what they were saying about him, he was more than someone special. He was someone divine. As, as uh, Luke and would record, some of the others, uh, each one of the, the Gospels has their own account of this story. But Luke says something I find very interesting. He says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Folks, it's an incredible story. We've read about it. And I think sometimes it has become so common that we forget what this really represents. Here was a new rabbi. Here was this, this new teacher who was coming into the community in the middle of this incredible uh, sense of excitement. And the people stop and praise him. As we look at this, there are just some wonderful things that we see. In fact, uh, you know, when you, when you start to look at, at what all is said and what all is done, we find some prophecies that are fulfilled here. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 is one of those prophecies. Another one comes from Psalm 118, 26. And I've read this story countless numbers of times. But there is something that I saw when I read it this week that really touched me. And it was what Luke said. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. In their praise of Jesus, the crowd captures an important part, an important aspect of Jesus' life and of his ministry. What Jesus was about, one of the things, one of the, the vital things that Jesus was about is peace. Now, folks, there's a message in this for us today. What our world needs now is peace, sweet peace. And that peace comes in the life and in the teachings and in the legacy that Jesus left us. I think it's interesting that while Jesus was praised on this particular day, 
it would be just a matter of a few days that he would be crucified. But even in that, even in his sacrifice, we're able to find peace. This morning, I want to take a look at three things that the story of Jesus and also this concept of Jesus being the, the man of peace. Three things that it can teach us. First of all, Jesus' sacrifice brings peace to sinners. Jesus' sacrifice brings peace to sinners. This account from the life of Jesus is important, but what happened just a few days later in the week, Jesus' crucifixion, that is really what changed history. You see, when sin happens, there are some things that are associated with it. First off, we alienate ourselves from God. But secondly, we become the target of God's wrath. And that may seem to be rather odd, but listen to what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. In a discussion of the nature of God, the writer says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is angered by sin, and that should scare us to death. That's the bad news. But the good news, if you want to call it the gospel, <laughs> is that Jesus has brokered a peace between his disciples and their God. What Jesus did through his sacrifice was restore the relationship between God and man. When Jesus voluntarily sacrificed himself on the cross, he served as a divine offering that appeased God's anger at sin. The religious concept is called propitiation. And Jesus became the propitiation for our sins. Let me see if I can explain. Let's see if John can explain this a little better. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he writes, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for those of the whole world. You see, because of Jesus' sacrifice, God is no longer angry. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we no longer have to live in fear. To go back and misquote the song from the 1960s, what the world needs now is to accept the peace offered by Jesus. The second thing that we can see in this, uh, in this lesson is that Jesus' teaching brings peace to conflict. Jesus' teaching brings peace to conflict. One of the most groundbreaking aspects of Christianity is its insistence on peaceful coexistence. Very early in Jesus' ministry, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. The concept of getting along in brotherly love was something that became so interwoven into Christianity that as Jesus described the essence of Christianity, he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. In essence, it's not something that we uh, we tattoo on ourselves. It's not something that we drive around and, and have uh, emblazoned on the back of our vehicles. The thing that will determine whether we are Christians is our love for one another. The love, the tolerance, and forgiveness Jesus personally showed for others throughout his life is a pattern for us today. When we reflect the way that Jesus lived, we're going to get along with most people because we set out to make peace with them. When we accept the responsibility of becoming Christians, we also accept the responsibility of getting along with people. We don't have a choice. If we are going to be Christians, we are going to be peaceful. We are going to be peacemakers. 
This responsibility, interestingly enough, is not just for those in our church family, not just for those in our physical family. This responsibility is spread out everywhere to those who are in our communities, to our neighbors, to those that, that we have contact with in the stores, and even to those that disagree with us, even with those who have disputes with us, and even to those who are angry at us. What the world needs now is the peace shown by Jesus. The final point that we wanna make this morning is that Jesus' presence brings peace to the anxious. Jesus' presence brings peace to the anxious. One of the most comforting passages anywhere in the Bible is found in Matthew chapter 8, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. When Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I think it's important to understand that Christianity is not lived in a vacuum. Christianity does not happen in some perfect utopia devoid of problems. And when you really think about it, Christians are the ones that go out and look for discomfort. You see, Christians have the responsibility to take care of themselves and the world around them. The world in which we live, the place in which we live, is can place an incredible burden on Christians just by what they have to experience, by what they have to deal with in imperfect times and in the cruel world in which we live. But again, that's not just with us, that's with everyone. There is a real challenge that we face because when we care, when we love one another, we take on the challenges that are faced by the, by the world, by those around us. Again, not only do we have to accept it in our own lives, but we also have to live with it as we deal with the lives of others. And folks, that can be scary, but I think that an even, an even bigger challenge is that that can be overwhelming. There are crises. There are struggles all around us. But Jesus, the one who overcame sin and death, promises us that he will be there with us and for us, and he will bring peace in his, in, in, uh, to the world. If you look at John chapter 14, there's an incredible passage in which Jesus promises a peace that no one else can understand. And those disciples that were there with him on that, that, that last night, they under, well, I don't know if they understood that, but hopefully at some point, as they were going through the challenges that they found in their lives, they could think back on what Jesus said as he talks about this incredible peace that he brought. But there's another passage that I wanna highlight, and this one is found in Philippians chapter four. In Philippians chapter four, verses four through seven, the apostle Paul writes this. Rejoice in the Lord always, again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Folks, we're living in uncertain times. You can highlight that. You can outline that in yellow, whatever you want to do. This is nothing new. But I think that it is important that it not get us down. You see, we are being told that these are unprecedented and uncertain times in today's world. But what we are not being told is that the world has always been an uncertain place. There have always been plagues. There have always been problems. There have been times of violence. Yes, today we're experiencing some things that we've never faced before, but it's nothing new in the world. It's always been this way. The issues of today are just another version. They're just another version of the chaos that has always existed in the world. There's always been death and danger. It just wasn't capturing the headlines that it captured or in the way that it captures them, that they are being captured today. Now, again, that's the bad news. The good news is that thanks to God, we don't have to worry. But if we do feel anxious, remember, 
we have someone who has promised to help. What the world needs now is the peace assured by Jesus. Let's pray together. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time, a time in which our world seems to be in an upheaval, a time in which our world seems uncertain. But the great thing that we know, number one, is that you are still in control. And that while we may not be able to see into the future and know how this will all come about and know when this will uh, when this will end, you do. You have the ability to interact in our world. You have the ability to help us in our individual lives. But this morning we come to you in prayer. And our prayer is this, that no matter what is going on in our world and in our lives, you bring us peace. We are so grateful that your, your son, that our Lord and our savior came into this world and provided us with peace through his sacrifice, through his life and through his teaching. And Lord, as we go out into the world today, we pray that you will bless us with a peace that only you can bring in our lives. We pray these things through Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As we finish up this morning, just a couple of kind of concluding thoughts. Number one, Christians should live a life of peace. Now, what that means for us is as we look around and as we see the people in our world today, we should be those that bring peace into their lives whether it's through the assurance of being Christians or whether it is in the, the, uh, the interaction that we have that shows tolerance and forgiveness. We have a call to be people who live in peace. But secondly, and maybe the most important takeaway from today is this, Christians can have a life of peace. You see, the greatest conflict has already been taken care of, the conflict between us and our God. Jesus Christ, through his death and then ultimately through his resurrection, brought a peace between mankind and God. But there is something that is, is so wonderful. And that is that when we have Jesus in our lives, when we are his disciples, he has promised us an internal peace. We don't understand how it happens. We don't know when it happens, where it happens. But we do know that it's possible. Our hope and our prayer for you this week is that you find peace in your life and that you share it with those around you. God bless.